Well, hello, everybody, and welcome again to the Satisfied God podcast. This is Raven Bird uh, with you again in this new episode. Thanks for listening and downloading and sharing, uh, whether you're listening on uh, Podbean or iTunes or Spotify. Uh, it's available on all other outlets where you find podcasts, uh, Podcast Attic and all those different places. Also uh, on the Satisfied God podcast page on YouTube. So wherever you're listening, however you're finding it, uh, man, we're just glad that you are. And I'm happy that uh, I'm hearing back from so many of you, uh, emails and phone calls and texts. And saying how much of a blessing these these lessons are to you, this uh, Romans uh, series has been. Uh, it's been a blessing to me. I've really been challenged and dealt with, and a, a, a real sense of certainty has come into my heart like never before uh, with this. I just thank God for it. Just so grateful to the Spirit for making Himself known in such a pure and sure way. And uh, I hope that's taking place in you as well. We're dealing with something real here, people. We're dealing with something so sure that it keeps us in the midst of ignorance. It holds us where we are. It anchors us in reality. Even before and until we are unto the appearing of the reality that is present. And that is so, so significant. I hope this is giving you some surety, some certainty. Religion takes it away and makes you the object of the thing, makes you the means, the method of achievement. But thank God, of God are we in Christ. That is a work of God, and it is of God that we know where we are. He makes it known, and Paul says it very plainly in Colossians, whom we preach, but he says, whom God would make known. Um, In the same couple of verses there in first chapter of Colossians, because that's what happens. We preach, we teach, we read, we study. God makes known, because that's that falls into his jurisdiction. That's his power. That's what he does. He brings it about and he shows you what he has brought about. He makes us to know that in which we are known of him. He brings us into a relationship that is exclusive unto his own self so that we can't take away or add to it. And then he shows us that relationship in the person of his son that we may enjoy and live in the realization and the acknowledgement and be, and be cognizant and coherent in such a sure, perfect, eternal fellowship, knowing that that fellowship is not I, but Christ who liveth in me. It's, it's there. It's governed in that. It's not governed by how much of that I am un- understanding or knowing. It is governed by that as certain, fulfilled, and perfectly realized in an eternal fellowship, an eternal covenant. I did a series of classes, uh, known of God. I, I haven't touched that on in this podcast, but I did a series, uh, about 40 different classes on, uh, entitled known of God. And it was upon that premise. The subtitle was, uh, relationship with God within the context of an eternal covenant. And, Basically, that's what we've come to. God has given his son to our soul as the covenant, the new covenant written in our hearts. So uh, we won't go off on that, but it's such a beautiful salvation. This is such a real salvation. So, so perfect. And it has been from the moment we were born of the seed of God and God just desires to make us to know it so we can live in that understanding and the understanding of what is real. And that breeds thanksgiving, gratefulness to the God of mercy, a God of grace who has bestowed into the soul such a great gift. Um, 
I titled this podcast many years ago, The Satisfied God. I wrote a book many years ago in 2012 called Knowing the Satisfied God, and it's still available out there. And speaking of that, Vivian, I hope you've enjoyed the books and giving them out. Uh, you have some more coming your way. But, and thank you uh, for the gift, by the way. I appreciate it very much, Vivian. Uh, it's a blessing. I, um, I wrote that book <clears throat> and I titled this, uh, podcast, Knowing the Satisfied God and the Satisfied God podcast, because to me, and I believe this is so, the premise of the gospel, the premise of the gospel, because the premise of the gospel stands always upon the reality of our salvation. The premise of the gospel is that the soul that is born of God begins with a satisfied God. We begin. This is, this is equivalent to Paul saying, having begun in the spirit. We begin from the very moment, the immediate moment of new birth. When you are born of God, born from above, you begin from that moment, at that moment, with a God who is fully satisfied. And, and the, this is all kind of in the book. We, we look at it throughout the book, but in my heart, I realized that there is no salvation that can be made available to the heart of man until God is fully and completely satisfied until he finds his intent and his delight realized. And he can say in certainty, it is finished, and say in certainty as he did in testimony when he created the, the creation in Genesis, he looked at it and saw it and he said, it is very good. And then he rested from his labor. And this is all found in Romans as well. He lit, rested from his labors. This is found throughout the scripture. This one who has fulfilled the intention of God, who is now the satisfaction of God lives in you. And, and when I say that, God has brought about a new creation and it is unto that new creation he can look and he can say of that creation, it is very good. And he can find his rest. He re Remember, he says, in this place, he speaks of Zion, the person of his son, it's a testimony, I will have my rest. This is, this is the place of my rest. This is the place where my name resides forever. This is the place where I find my Sabbath. This is where the conclusion of all my labor is found. This is it. This is the culmination. Because for salvation to be a reality, and I'm speaking of salvation in us, for God to ever offer it as a possibility to man, he can't be just making it up as he goes along or finishing it as he goes. He, that's not God's, uh, mode of operation. We have one who is called the beginning and the end, not the means to an end but the beginning and the end. So what we're having to understand is that salvation for it to ever be offered to the soul and real in the soul that is born of God, he must, God must have one, one unto whom he can declare and say, you are my beloved because he does say it in a personal way. I think it's in Mark. Uh, other places say thou art or this is my beloved son, but I think it's in Mark where he, he specifically speaks to that son saying, you are my beloved in whom I have eternally delighted in some literal translations in whom I have always been delighted. Taking it beyond just that moment and the work that he will do to who he is. But for him to ever offer salvation to the soul there has to be one to whom he can say this. You are my beloved in whom my pleasure is found fully. 
And he finds that and now possesses that in the one that he has raised up and the one who he has glorified and found pleasure in. And he's found pleasure in storing up, concealing within that one all things of spiritual perfection. Or we can say all things of spiritual, of, of spiritual conclusion. Because perfect and conclusion basically means the same thing, comes from the same word, meaning the end of the matter, the goal, the conclusion, the perfect point where a thing is realized. Now, having raised up that one, glorified that one, those who hear his voice or those who receive him receive a full and complete salvation, needing nothing, lacking nothing, a salvation without sin, without falling short, without anything missing at all. Unfortunately, there is a concept out there today that God is still finds him, that God still finds himself in a state of dependence, waiting for a specific group or a company of people who will bring about some culminated period of time, a culmination, a a period in which his intention is finally culminated and, and made complete, in which God will finally have what he has desired and hoped for. But see, he will have that, According to these people, he will have that due to the actions and the spiritual acumen of that group of people. Instead of him being fully satisfied with the son of his love and translating us, the soul, into the kingdom of that beloved one wherein we are known of God in the exclusivity of that context, of that one. But those who, it's, it's interesting that those who always espouse this, and this is not the only time frame in which that's been declared. Throughout church history, it's been, it's been said. It's nothing new. But those who seem to, you know, espouse this type of concept and declare this time frame for the manifest conclusion of God's intent, They always, and I guess coincidentally it seems, declare it to be imminent within the time in which they live. It's going to happen in our day, in our generation. They always say, this is the generation he was talking about. This is, this is the generation he meant. 2000 years later, we're, we're, this is finally it. This is the, this is the generation. So they declare that God is anxiously awaiting some elect group or some elect brotherhood to usher in what God did not or could not usher in himself by his own power. And the audacity of that just floors me. And this gets into where we are because of the certainty of these statements that we are we are pointing to or reading or dealing with in this, in this chapter. There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. If anything of our salvation is still hanging out in the future in any way, that, that statement could never have been written. It'll take you a while to just think about that, but that's true. You can't make such conclusive statements of absolute Fact, absolutes, when there's still something out dangling in the future. No way. That is why the, what we, uh, or what some look at as a condition with that statement is not actually there. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Again, this is Romans 8 1. That is not in the manuscript. And we'll read in a moment, uh, uh, tra- uh, a commentary, a weast word studies, uh, talking about that. So they basically would say that there's this 
elect brotherhood of men is going to finally usher in what God himself has not been able to, or that God was dependent on us to finally bring it about. And there's no scripture that says that. There's no scripture that hints to it. There's scriptures that say the exact opposite of that, of course. And I know people will latch on to the manifested sons of God in Romans 8, and they'll talk about that, but basically it's saying the exact opposite of what most people think. Now, for me, I believe the journey of the soul, the journey of the believer who has resident within him the one satisfaction of God is a journey of God showing to the soul, demonstrating to the soul, this beloved comprehensive one in his length, breadth, depth, and height. So that we will know as we are known, that we will behold a glory that is already present in the appearing of Christ our life. That's Colossians chapter 3 verse 4. You read verses 1 through 4, it takes you to a good context of that. I no longer believe. I used to at one time, in a, in a way, I used to believe that God still awaited it. But I no longer believe that God, God is awaiting any further activity or any event to finally possess that which he has always been after. He has all things in one. That's said throughout. It pleased him that in his son all fullness should dwell, that everything was to the, to the, uh, pointed to the fullness of time. This is Ephesians chapter one, wherein he would bring all things in heaven and earth and conclude them in one, even Christ. And it is that one who abides in you if you are born of his seed, of his spirit. There is only one who fully demonstrates in the sight of God, God's intention realized in its ultimate fulfillment. The one who is the amen. The one who declares, I am come to do thy will, O God. The volume of the book is written of me, not anyone in me, not anyone other but me. How can we interpret scripture with us in it when the volume of the book is about him? And the New Testament is written declaring him of whom the volume of the book uh, testifies now being resident in you. And living in you as all that that testimony declared he was. And this is what I mean when I say that being born again, that the soul that is born again has now come into a relationship with a God who is satisfied. I believe that is the most beautiful statement that can ever be said. Salvation is a soul coming into a relationship with a fully satisfied God. And that means that God is not looking for his satisfaction in any way, anywhere else, but that he desires to share with the soul, the one in whom his delight, his pleasure is complete. Because that's the one who's in you. And here's the point. The moment that we suppose that any aspect of our salvation has been postponed to any degree, that means it's yet to be real or yet to be efficacious or effective, sufficient. We have at that moment invalidated, and not really, but in our hearts, 
we have invalidated the certainty of our salvation in total, not just in part, but in total. Why? Because we're not dealing with the I will be or the I will make it so, but we are dealing with the I am. We can't say that we are declaring a person and then break that person down into a multitude of dispensationalized parts and pieces. And I'm not speaking of the eschatology in time dispensationalism. I'm speaking of the pieces you get. You get this portion and then you get this and then you get this. No, I am means I am. When we're speaking of a person, we cannot piece and parcel that person in any way, shape or form and believe we're declaring the person. You can't say he's the I am and then make that a process when he is there. When he's there, everything he is is there. There is now the issue of what? Growing in the knowledge of him. The grace that has brought him into the soul is all things, is all fullness, is all sufficiency. Made unto your soul all things of life and godliness. The journey now is knowing him, knowing the reality that God has by grace ushered into the soul by his own doing, by his own power. See, the gospel is basically to declare, is the declaration of who he is. Not a piece or a part, but who he is, the I am. But the Spirit causes us to know him as he is. The gospel declares who he is, but the Spirit causes us to know him as he is. So the gospel should always direct you to the spirit for him, the spirit to make known in you the one of whom we are speaking. And I hope that's what this podcast does. Not postpone any aspect of your salvation, but say that everything of your salvation has come to reside in your soul in the one who is the delight and the pleasure of God, his hope which is what we're going to get into in Romans 8, his hope fulfilled, his hope realized. The thing in which he delights is now resident in you. He doesn't look or assess you to find any of that. So when we, when we look at this statement, there is therefore, this is King James, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And basically, again, if you read it in the Greek, it would say it this way. The Greek text would read more specifically this way. There is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Because the word in takes in, when you look at it in a uh, a parallel or not an interlinear uh, translation, you'll see that to them which are in, is actually one word, and it's the word in. It doesn't truly refer to them who are in it, but just the place in which they are. So he's saying the place in which they are, Christ himself, that realm, that relationship, is a realm in which there is no condemnation. How can that be so? Because that place and the nature and characteristics of that place is not determined by those who are in it, but the one in whom they are. Now that's very simple, but profound in its, in its simplicity because it takes man out of it and makes the place. His predetermined place is declared right here where he predestined and predetermined all things right here. And it's a place where there is no condemnation at all. And we have a hard time realizing the absoluteness of this. Because we want to hold on to many caveats and exceptions to that statement. But Paul is referencing reality in a perfect man. And we are trying to reference reality in view of a natural corrupt man. And again, there is a translation here, down here in my notes, let's see. Oh yeah, here it is. This is the Weiss translation, Kenneth Weiss expanded translation. It says, therefore now there is not even one bit of condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. Now see, we can relate that to those in Christ because it's a reality in Christ. 
because Christ is the reality of that, because he's the one, the good fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, unto whom no accusation of wrong, no judgment of wrongdoing, no condemning word can ever be spoken against that one who is your life. See, So that absolute statement can be made because the absoluteness of it is secured in the person of a perfect man in whom you now live and not in yourself, ever. No, never will it be. There will not be a moment in time where you can also be a reference point to that statement. The only way your soul becomes to any degree associated with such an absolute statement is to be in Christ Jesus. Same thing as saying, if any be in Christ, any man be in Christ, again, that sphere, that realm, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, the new has come. And you say, no, 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 there's a lot of old stuff still there. No, not in the true reference point. There is not. The problem is... Although it's absolute in the reference point of God, because our reference point is still the wrong reference point so many times, we are still trying to assess these statements in the light of that false reference point. That is why the revealing of Christ is necessary to show us the one in whom such absoluteness is found. Bless God for that. But you stand in the absoluteness of it because he is in you and you are found in him. You reside. He abides in you. You abide in him. That's, that's the reality of salvation. There is nothing that can change that. Nothing that can change that. Your ignorance can't change it. Actions, activities, thoughts, words, none of that has the power to Undo what God has done. Remember again, uh, we go back to Numbers 24, such a beautiful thing. And Balaam says of the people that he's beholding from a above perspective and he sees their encampment and he sees them. And this is referring back again, Colossians, where Paul says, I am chapter two at the very beginning of chapter two in Colossians. Paul says, I am beholding your order. He doesn't mean your governmental order of your ministry or your ministerial order of your organization. Come on. You know, the way you elect preachers or whatever. That's ridiculous. He's saying, I'm beholding your true order. And he begins to declare to them the true order. And that is you have been uh, forever sanctified or circumcised with a circumcis circumcision made without hands in the putting off of an entire body of flesh. And a body of death. And you have been brought into him where your life is hidden with Christ in God. You are dead and your life is, that's the order. That's the work of the cross. That's the order of a, <clears throat> of a soul, of a, of a body that is found in one, one man whose very existence before God is determined in a perfect Man and by a perfect life. And it refers back this beholding your order in Colossians. You can take all what I'm saying back again to Numbers 24 where he says this. Uh, Numbers 23 verse 20. Behold, I have received commandment to bless and he hath blessed. Talking about God. He hath blessed and I cannot reverse it. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord, his God, is with him. And the shout of a king is among them. So there is a certain strength to this. There is a certainty that keeps them, and it's God's own perspective and God's own doing. What God has wrought, because he says it will be said of them, behold what God has wrought. And tied up with that is the fact where he says, God has blessed it and I can't reverse it. And you can't either. You can't reverse this. This is a sure thing. <laughs> wow. It is all or nothing, guys. It is all or nothing. 
There are no pieces and parts and dispensationalized fragments. It is all him or nothing. It is the I am or nothing. I'm not talking yet about comprehending, understanding. I'm talking about absolutes, something that's certain and sure, and that is the person of Christ in you. And that is the one the Spirit of God will guide us on in our knowing. The Spirit guides us on in the perfection of his being, causing us to know him as he is. So there is not one bit of condemnation to those who are in Christ. Now, again, that that secondary part there of that verse is not actually here. And let me read this um, from the Kenneth Weiss word study. The words, this is Weiss word study, it says the words who, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit are rejected by both Nestle and Westcott and Hort. Paul does not base his assertion of no condemnation. This is important. Paul does not base his assertion of no condemnation to the saint upon the saint's conduct, but upon his position in Christ, his relation, the union of the soul to the person of Christ. His position in Christ, believer, his position in Christ, has liberated him from the power of sin and made him a partaker of the divine nature. That takes you to Peter. We're going to go to Peter in a moment. The new inner condition, I like that, a new inner or inward condition that brings about in every saint a life which has for its mode of obedience to his commandments. Now that's basically, I would say it this way, that God has ushered into the soul the life that is the fulfillment of the commandments. That's what he says in Romans 8, the law, righteous of the law fulfilled in us. And we'll get to that uh, later on, but uh, let's see. In other words, it is what God has made the believer that ensures the fact that there is no cause for condemnation in him. And he says it's further explained in the verses below, verses 2 through 4. So, such a certainty. God is not saying there is no condemnation because you don't do bad things anymore. There is now no con. Let's, let's go to a verse real quick because this takes you, and basically we're just picking up where we left off here uh, in the last class. Uh, I think in the last class we, we ended in uh, Galatians chapter 2 where Peter and Paul were having their um, confrontation. And if not, I'll go back and listen to it and we'll deal with it. But uh, when most people interpret, uh, interpret the word condemnation, they interpret it in terms of punishment for bad actions. But that's not the thought. And this is why it's it's vital to see how when addressing these two states defined in and determined by two men, there is no carryover. Paul's not carrying something over into Christ. He's showing an absolute division between two men here. You are in one or you are in the other. One seed is in you or you are born of the seed of another. All are nothing. Your state is absolute in the man to whom you are joined. Again, notice Weiss. There is not even one bit of condemnation in Christ. Because that statement means that lack of condemnation cannot be based upon action. It cannot be turned on and turned off depending upon the fickleness and the variableness of activities. And that takes us back to what we were dealing with in Galatians 2. In Christ, Galatians 2, in that argument in our previous podcast, is Christ the minister or the administrator of sin? I believe in that last one I was kept saying administrate, minister, administer, uh, administrator of sin. What does that statement mean? For one thing, it means that for Paul, there are no gray areas. 
you were administered righteousness fully and completely in Christ, or you are still fully and completely in sin. No gray areas. There's no carryover. If we have sought, Paul says to Peter, if we have sought to find true and absolute righteousness in Christ, but then tell the Gentiles that they need the law or need to live according to law to fully apprehend the righteousness that we left the law to find, then we're stating Christ is actually the one who is administering sin as a continual and perpetual state. He hadn't delivered us from anything. He hadn't brought liberty to the soul at all. And that is not a state where there is no condemnation. So that can't be true. So for the external law to have any validity for us at all is an admission that Christ keeps us in sin and death and does not bring liberty and deliverance through righteousness and life. Now this takes us back. When reading this in, in eight, chapter 8, verse 1, this takes us or should take us immediately back to the statement written by Paul in Romans 5, verses 16 through 18, because this basically contextualizes verses 8, or chapter 8, verse 1. Now, Romans 5, 16 through 18, and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. You hear that? The judgment was by one, that's Adam, unto condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For for if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Or as we've read in one translation, I think Young's or Weiss, a justification or a righteousness that has to do with life. There is one particular life in which righteousness is realized and is real and sure and is Christ, our life. So we have to keep this context in mind when this, these verses in mind when we're reading, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, or as we said, there is now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Because we have to realize in that context that the absence of condemnation has everything to do with an internal transition or translation from one man to another and not actions or activities at all. We have been brought from the man who brought in and bestowed on all condemnation. We have been brought from that man unto the man who, whom through the abundance of grace and the bestowal of righteousness brought a soul to the justification of life, the justification justification that has to do with one particular perfect life. I'm going to jump ahead for a moment here because this, this, this brings you right to Romans chapter 8, verse 31. And this is from the Weiss translation. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect or God's chosen out ones? That's those called out from among the dead. Called out from the flesh into the spirit. The ones who have received the above invitation. It's not some particularly elite company of people. God, the one who justifies, is he the one that's going to bring a charge against you if you are in Christ? Who is the one who condemns or brings about condemnation to those who are in him? Christ, the one who died, yet yes, rather, who has been raised. Remember, if he be not risen, you're still in your sin. But if he is raised and he's in you, 
then there has been a true deliverance from the one state of sin and death to the true and living state of righteousness and life. Who has been raised, who is on the right hand of God, showing certainty and absoluteness and finished work, who also is constantly interceding on our behalf? Are those the ones that's going to bring condemnation? Because if God himself who did this work, who brought about this no condemnation state of being, who brought my soul into the state of being where there is no condemnation, if he's not the one bringing charge against me, guess what? I don't care what you say. None of your opinions stick. If God be for us. Who can be against us? See, that's in the context of that. Not all these people coming against you with swords and you know sticks. But those who would bring in something of the realm of condemnation into the realm where there is no condemnation. Those are the ones he's talking about. Who can be against us in that way? Because they can't reverse the blessing. They can't bring the cursed thing into the realm where there is nothing of the curse, nothing of sin, nothing of death. And we could go to chapter 1 of Galatians for that. Let them be accursed. See, we'll get to this in time in Romans 8, 31, but let's consider this verse just for a second. Who is the one who condemns, brings any allegation or judgment against? Is it Christ who died and rather who has raised constantly interceding for us? And I love this. Because this takes everything and puts it in the proper place and pre, pre, uh, uh, places everything of our salvation in the surest of places. Is it possible that the one who is now in us, lives in us, made unto us all spiritual fullness, who did all of this, who did the work, and with whom we have been given all things, is it possible that he can now can, can that he can now condemn those who are found in him? See, I want you to see the sure and anchored reality in whom this is settled. This is settled in one. This is fixed and settled upon in one man, and that man is Christ in you. Because he ever liveth to make intercession for you. Hebrews 7.23, but this priest... Because he is abiding forever, has the priesthood, which is untransferable, meaning he has it forever. It's his, never transferred to anyone else, for which reason he is able to be saving completely. Listen to that. He is able to be saving completely and forever those who come to God through him. The King James says, save to the uttermost. I like that too. He is able to save them to the uttermost. Do you realize that you have an uttermost salvation? That you have been saved to the uttermost? That you have been saved completely and forever? Because you have through him come to God? To certify and make that more certain. He goes on and says this, being always alive for the purpose of continually making intercession for them. See, it's not that he's standing there saying, Lord, I pray for Rabin. I'm interceding for him. I'm praying for him. And he's doing that on 24 hour basis and doing it for everyone else as well. That's not him ever living to make intercession for us. It's not him pleading our case before God 24-7. It is him living before God, in the sight of God. And in that, he liveth in the sight of God and stands there as the surety, the certainty, and the defining measure of salvation. He, his living, His ever living, his forever priesthood, non-transferable priesthood that he exercises in the sight of God is his making intercession. 
for us. That's the intercession. He lives, not I, but Christ liveth. It's him standing here. This is Hebrews 9.24. That's what he's saying here. Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figure of the true, but into heaven itself, not a type, but the true heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. He is not saying nobody can condemn you because you don't do anything bad. This is about no condemnation as the sure state and condition of those who are found in this one who ever lives. And thus, who in that one have a salvation to the uttermost. That's what it means there is now no condemnation in Christ. For he now stands in the sight or presence of God, determining fully God's relationship to the soul to which he is united. There is no vanity, there is no corruption in Christ, and against such a one there is no law. Now, we'll end here as we go to Peter. This will be the last thing we look at. Now see, when you're ignorant of such an absolute state, you can continue to live on a day-to-day basis as one who is condemned. Now, in not in reality... Not as a re, not as a real condition of the soul because the soul is secured and saved to the uttermost and de- that is determined by the one who lives in you. But if you're ignorant of the one who lives in you, such a certainty is lost on you. It's still there. Your soul is still kept. All things are good. It is perfect, but your soul is not enjoying it. Therefore, in ignorance, you can live with the wrong reference point. And you can still assess yourself because, see, condemnation or the assumption of condemnation stems from a perspective that is bound to the first man. Paul Paul calls it an evil conscience. An evil conscience. And we must be purged from an evil conscience. How do you have that? You're purged from an evil conscience when you see the good thing. And then your soul has a good conscience when it's beholding the good thing. The good, perfect object upon which God's sight is fixed. Because the word conscience means knowledge that is joined to something with knowledge, joined with a knowledge joined to something. What is the understanding of your heart joined to? To what does it look to find reality? Because reality, nonetheless, has found you in the person of Christ. But is your soul beholding that one, or are you seeing yourself? And that that's that's right here. Um, you're looking at a man who, in external assessment, this is an ignorance of reality that is present. You are looking at a man who, in an, in external assessments and in outward condition, lacks anything, something, maybe everything. According to your assessment. Now, this takes us to Peter. We've already looked at, um, Peter, where we said that he had given us partakers now of a divine nature. That's not something yet to be. That's a reality because you're in Christ. And as partakers of the divine nature, he says, this is Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4, given unto us exceeding great precious promise, by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped, that's the same thing as having delivered us from the body of death, freed us from the uh, law of sin and death, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, and beside this, and then he goes on. Now, I want to go on here and read these things. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. Now, if you read this just on face value of the King James, it would say add to, and that's that man. People grab hold of that and they take that as a real mission and as, as basically a challenge to say, okay, now the divine nature is not sufficient. 
So to that divine nature, who is Christ himself, by the way, um, <coughs> I have to add uh, faith. Uh, or I have to give my diligence to add to faith virtue. And I have to give my diligence to add to virtue knowledge and then to knowledge temperance. So I have all of this list of things and I check one at a time off as I get them, as I uh, achieve that level. Now, remember what we said earlier? I am. There are no levels there. There's no pieces, parts. You don't have that. God does not uh, issue him to you in that way. He doesn't distribute his son in fragments and pieces. The I am is in you. So it, as those who are partakers of the divine nature, this is not now add to that this, this, and this. No, if you have him, you have it all. The word here for add to is actually fully furnished, meaning it's a reality that God has fully furnished that you must come to realize, recognize that in this divine nature is fully furnished virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience. That's the fruit of the spirit, right? That's not something you achieve. That's someone whom God has achieved in you. <laughs> if you could say it that way. So and then he goes on, and he's talking about these things being fully furnished in you. This is a recognition of a fully furnished salvation of a fully furnished life in which dwells holiness and righteousness and every good thing. So now he goes on in verse 8 and says, For if these things be in you, how are they in you? Because he's in you. And they abound. And we say, oh, they haven't abounded yet. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. They have. They do. You must, you may be ignorant of the abounding of it or the abundance of it. But they are in you and they abound. They make that you are neither barren. Do you see that? It's not they give you the potential not to be. They make this so. These things in you, which is Christ himself, not to pluralize it, but if he's in you, that's sure, makes sure, and makes you un, not barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will bring this about. He is the substance of it, and he is the realization of it. Now, verse 9. Now, for a second, let's, let's look at this just a second. John chapter 10. Do you remember Jesus saying this very plainly? Because this is, this is, uh, if, if, if these things be in you and abound, they make that you are neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, You'll say, oh, they don't abound yet. Well, Jesus says, I am come that they may, I think this is John 10, I am come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. So we say when we get Christ, we have the life, but we don't have abundant life. So all of these other things have to be done and procedures have to be done to get abundant life. That is ridiculous. The life that he is, is the abounding, abundant life of God. We just read it <clears throat> in Romans 7. Did we not just, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Do we have to wait on that? The abundance of grace hath abounded unto many in one by one man. Grace by one man, Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. Is there a time, you know, is there an abounding that is now and an abounding that's later? No, it is a life in the knowledge of which we grow. It's a life that we come to know and comprehend in all of its fullness. The abundance of this is sure because of the abundant one, the abounding one, the fruitful vine who's, who's present. So he goes on in chapter 3. I mean, I'm sorry, in chapter 1 of, of second, second Peter. But he that lacketh these things is blind. Now, all this started with the, the, the thought and the concept of 
condemnation stems from a perspective that is tied to or bound to the man of flesh, the man of, of earth, the first man, the outward man. So in verse 9, he says it very plainly, he that lacketh these things. And if you'll look it up, it's very easy to look up. This is an assumption of lack. This is not that he actually lacks it, but that he assumes that he lacks it. It's the same thing in Hebrews, he says, in Hebrews, and we, we skip over this many times, <clears throat> in chapter um, verse, verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 4 says it this way. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Did you hear that word? Seem. Most people read it, read that word, and still believe that it's saying, you better fear because you might have come short of this. This may be something you've come short of. That's not what he's saying to the Hebrews at all. The whole context of this letter to the Hebrews is that they haven't come short of anything, that in fact they have come to the spiritual conclusion of all that God said and did under the Old Testament administration, the Old Covenant, that testimonial age. He has spoken it in his son, and if that all that he had said to the prophets by unto the fathers by the prophets, he has concluded once and for all, and amen in his son, and he declared that son to be the substance of it all. And if that son's in you, guess what? You haven't come short of anything. But the fear is that you should the rest that has that is left for us to enter into, that rest that God said it's still available. That you, being ignorant of the substance to which you have come, would assume that you have come short of it. Because such an assumption will open you up to being prey to those who would bring you back to the types, the shadows, the externalities of the law. To bring you to look at your own external production for the validation and legitimacy of your relationship with God. The fear is that it would seem that you've come short of this rest. That's an assumption that many people still have in their hearts, and one day they're going to get rest, or they're laboring and laboring and laboring. to find. No, the labor to enter in the rest is the knowing of him. The rest has come. The Sabbath day is now in you. God has brought you to the conclusion of his own delight and purpose and intention. He has found the one he says it is very good in whom he says it is very good and unto whom he declares you are my beloved one. And that's the one he has gifted to your soul as the gift of grace. You have not come short of rest. You have not come short and you lack nothing. But if there is an assumption of lack to any degree, a lack of any of these things he's just talked about, virtue, knowledge, patience, godliness, charity, those things that are now abounding in you and make that you are not barren or unfruitful because uh, such a false assumption of lack causes you to believe that you are, even in Christ, unfruitful. So you try to bear fruit or you're barren. So you try to give birth and all of these things stem for one thing. He that lacketh these things is blind and he cannot see afar off. The word there blind and cannot see afar off the cannot see. Here's blindness defined, cannot see afar off. And if you look it up, it means beholds his own face, beholds his own countenance, can't see anything beyond his own appearance. He assesses the wrong man to see the right thing. And he calls that blindness. And in such blindness, you can still live as one who is under condemnation when in fact and in state of being, there is no condemnation because of the one in whom you live and the one who lives in you. And he further solidifies the statement by saying this, he has forgotten. 
he cannot see afar off and have forgotten, hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sin. That sounds like the same thing we're talking about in Romans, right? It's freed me from the law of sin and death. What? The law of life. Another man, another life. And in that life is fully furnished, fully supplied all spiritual realities. But if that, if the understanding of that is lacking, it doesn't mean the reality is lacking at all, but I can still be blind, meaning I can look at my own appearance or anyone else's appearance to try to find the validity and legitimacy of that certainty. And if I don't find it in the face of man, I feel as if it's still missing and I seem to come short of it. And if you seem to come short of it, you're going to be prey to those who will give you every step in the book to try to achieve what you believe you've come short of. And you have forgotten that God has purged you from your old sin from your condition of death and sin in Adam. Where all these things were lacking, all these things were missing, where these things were not real and these things were not even possible. In Adam, they're not. But in Christ, they're not only possible, they are present. And he has made unto you the substance of them all. Because all is found in one. So, he has forgotten he was purged from his old sins. Uh, this is a <coughs> commentary here. I think, I'm not sure. This may be Weiss, but he says this is a once, yeah, this is Weiss. Once and for all accomplished cleansing that took place at the time of new birth is actually symbolically taught by Christ himself. And he, he took this in John 13 and 10. And he's taking it from the original Greek language and he's interpreting it from that. He says he, and he's given some parentheses, so this will be some, uh, it's hard, maybe hard to understand, but John 13 and 10, he that has been bathed once and for all, he adds in parentheses, needeth not to wash his feet of the soils contracted in his daily walk. You see, something that's happened once and for all can't be redone because it can't be reversed. So you don't have to redo it every day because you got a little soil on you. See, that's hard, man. Isn't that hard for some to believe? That's hard for us to believe. Now, this is not licensed to live any way you want. It's saying that we have a sure life, a sure salvation, an absolute uttermost salvation that is certain and certified and sure because one liveth and in that he liveth he is our intercession his living is our, is an intercession for us once he's been bathed once and for all he needs not to wash his feet of soil contracted in the daily walk but is clean every whit Parenthesis, in Christ, who is righteousness. And Hebrews 10 says it this way. Once purged, we should have no more conscience of sin as one condemning us. And he says, this is the baptism we have come to. This is the baptism we have been baptized with. If you go into Peter in the first letter of Peter's, you see the same thing. This is chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Uh, likewise, un, uh, the like figure, where he's talking about Noah and the ark and what happened there, the doing away of an entire creation. Eight souls were saved by water. Like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Again, not the daily things contracted, the soil on the feet but an answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why does he bring the resurrection in? Because if the one raised is not raised, then you are still in your sin. There is no change of state of being. No matter what your change of conduct may be, the state of being is not touched if he be not raised. And if the one raised is not in you, that's a change of state. 
That's a change of, uh, of relationship. This baptism is not about outward. The baptism is the equivalent to the picture of Noah and the ark and God washing away once and for all the corrupt and evilness of an entire creation. And in one man who he beholds as righteous before him, defining an entire creation, a new creation. So much more is it in Christ. The baptism that doth now save us. Baptism doth now save us, meaning they're not two opposite things. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Again, the certainty of this is not about the absence of actions that can be condemned, but the presence of one who cannot be condemned. The life in you that cannot have any judgment brought against it. This is not saying you have no more conscience of sin because you no longer do inappropriate things, but that Your soul's relationship with God is fixed upon something or someone much greater and much more certain than that. And that is the one who ever lives in his sight as an intercession for us. So we'll stop there today. I want you to consider these things. Just put them before the Lord. Consider this. Reach out to me with comments or communication and call me. I want to talk to you about it. If your heart is after knowing him, if you just want to debate theological things and argue, then that's really not my style. I don't do that. Don't care to. I could, could do it for a long period of time. Probably find great pleasure in arguing, but the scripture is not open for our arguments. It's not to provoke argument is to guide us, to direct us, to behold the life that is within us. And if that's what you want, then I'm here and I'm open and I'm always available to you. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Those of you who are communicating with me and listening on a regular basis, you're such a blessing. May our hearts be ever open to the work of the Spirit of God, which work is to enlighten the eyes of our understanding, that we may know the greatness of our great salvation. Until next time, amen.